Thank, thanks so much for this. Um, so I completely agree with you that the um, Cartesian way of thinking is like gets like, really puts us in lots of trouble. And I really like the way you try to bypass this yes. problems with Aristotle. I was just wondering whether what would be your view about other ways of dealing with this? There's many traditions that could help us to bypass this problem. So I'm thinking of Buddhism. What, what would be our traditions uh, that could be helpful to, to, to get out of these problems? And a really good question is to what extent this modern science probably has this commitment to this sort of uh, physicalist um, yeah. project? Yeah, I, I think on the, the first question goes beyond, beyond my range. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, Perhaps you can say a little more about that. On the second question, um, I was suggesting that modern science isn't committed to the reductionist project. I think that's a philosopher's way of understanding modern science, as we're getting a, a tremendous project, which, of course, when you read Descartes, he saw that project very clearly in Le Monde. His, his essay. He imagines, as it were, carrying through a reduction, as it were, getting everything explained in terms of the basic approach up to a certain level. And then it, then it failed. But that's the kind of, kind of idea, a dream, he called it, as it were, of, I like the dream of the Theaetetus, the beginning with simples and working up. Um, but I think that's a philosopher's way to understand science, which may indeed have permeated scientific practice as a part of the ideology. <laughs> but I don't think it's where it's committed by the claims of, if seen in the, in the way which Galileo probably did, of thinking of these claims as in some sense abstractifying and simplifying from reality and giving a good account of the simpler as well what you get when seen in a simpler focus. So I don't think, I don't think actually this is incon uncongenial to um, anything other than a certain ideology. Now as to the question as whether Buddhism does a better job, <laughs> a better job um, it takes me quite a long time to work out <laughs> What's, what's problematic in the Western tradition. So how, how does Buddhism help, actually? Well, they would take the mind as a, um, as a starting point, right? I mean, they would not question the existence of like yes. uh -huh. the mind. Yes. Right. And then they would go from there. I mean, they, they would not, they don't fall in idealism. Right. They, they find a way of, uh -huh. they, they, they become, they don't think of the mind or what is Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I see the general structure of the position. But of course, what's interesting about the Western, about the Athenian approach, is that he's really engaging with particular problems. Um, I mean, and the problem I think which he inherited from Plato was he wanted to hold that the mind controlled the body and to explain how that was the case. So how, how it was the case that action could be explained in terms of psychological phenomenon. So it's not quite enough to say it's clear we have a mind, <laughs> um, because at least there's this constraint that the account of the mind has to be adequate to um, begin to account for the way in which the mind interacts with the world and is interacted with by the world. So it's a very interesting point you make. I mean, I'm not really sure how, as it were, to operate um, I mean, of course, there are traditions of philosophy which are sceptical of the existence of bodies. <laughs> but, I mean, that's a, that's a much more radical move than um, I'm coming. Uh, so, this is meant to be a question rather than an objection, but there may be an objection behind it. Very good. Uh, so, uh, the, some of the examples you used, but not all of them, uh, clearly involve psychophysical processes, capacities, etc., not events, meaning that your prime yes. example and revenge, but they involve something further, namely the world. You yes. can't read of course. unless you have Absolutely. Material. Absolutely. So, 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 so it seems to Absolutely. Me that an extended mind would be a better picture, more, a fuller picture, let's say, than just an embodied mind of capacities, etc. So, so I just wanted to see what your reaction No, I completely agree with that, actually. And... Um, Thank you, that's very helpful. I, mean, I didn't mean to be operating in a kind of um, 
internalist fashion here. Mm -hmm. um, um, indeed, if you see, you think of the accounts of perception as well as action. Um, I think the picture which Aristotle drew is of things in the world impinging on us. We can't make sense of taste, for example, mm -hmm. other than as reaction to flavors in the environment. Um, so that's absolutely correct. I mean, um, it may be talk of, the, of embodied cognition, as it were, is too local. Um, good. Um, and your thought might be better to put it as, as a... Extended. Yes, the extended is correct, of course, but you, you have to capture also the connection to the, to the, to the body. Um, so, I mean, we need a better slogan, don't we? A world involving bodily yeah. engagement. Yes, yes. yes. So, so these are world involving processes. Yes. Because you don't want to do the process either. No, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's crucial. Yeah. Yes. Well, these processes surely extend out into the world. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, um, and that's, in a way, you're bringing out why I was using weaving yeah. as, as the case, actually. Thinking of weaving as something which does really involve engagement with the, with the loom and the wool. Yeah. But, but that's very helpful. Just, just yes, good. It just that the, 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 so, so the understanding of process becomes very complicated because it's, it's a process that actually involves something beyond the process. So, so you know, the weaving involves an object that is not necessarily part of the process. Yes. Uh, yes, that's true. I mean, processes are presumably ways of moving objects, for example. I, mean, I, I, I take all sorts of ideas in view to be that what the process is can be thought of as the causing the object to move. The process is the causing, mm. as it were. Not that the causes are the initiator and the effect, but the process itself is the causing, mm. is, the, is the pulling and pushing mm. of the things in question, as Anscombe said. <laughs> so um, that's absolutely correct. Um, the processes are world involving, for sure, on this picture. Uh, and object involving, but one doesn't want to reduce the objects to processes, mm -hmm. which I take it was Whitehead's move mm -hmm. in this case. Yeah. Um, no, that, that, that's very helpful. That, that helps me to say more clear what I was trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, just really more about what you said yesterday. Um, Good. It occurred to me when you summarized it today, you talked about the two components theory yes. again. Yes. And it seems to me that really two very different kinds of component theories. And yesterday, you talk a little bit about component theories of emotion. Yes. It seems to me they don't really fall under the same way to characterize it because typically what they do, they would isolate the cognitive components and then there's sort of the non-cognitive components. But they are not really committed to the fact that there's non-cognitive components that are purely physical. No, sure. But there would be desires, feelings, sensations. Absolutely. So I can grant that they are, well, psychological, uh, uh, or one can sort of leave this open. Um, so one part of the question is whether you want to reject both types of component theories, and uh, I think you know I think what must be done to to reject this second type of component theory because I think there are some really really convincing uh, cases in support of it. So when I think of some e emotions, they have the peculiar feature that just one small bit of information can just completely pull the rug, you know. Yes, I can. If you learn something, or if you, you can just see it, something in a slight different way, the emotion just evaporates in an instant. And it looks like that sort of the, the, the cognitive component, once you take that away, the sort of, sort of the emotion has kind of a sort of a self-sustaining dynamic to it. And once you take out the cognitive component, the once the sort of the thought, I have been wrong, you know, once that is sort of in one flash, once that overturns, the whole emotion just, just you know, collapses. And that seems to me something that these component theories of the second type are really in a much better position to explain than a, than a non-component uh, theory of, of emotion. I do want to reject both kinds, but I've been focusing really, as it were, on bringing the body side into yes. the equation, not focusing, as it were, on the p thought there could be several components to the psychological level. And you're quite right, that's a different kind. I've, I've just been focusing on, as it were, in the emotion case, on thinking that in these cases, there are things like excitement, intensity, um, tension, 
which as it were looked to be psychophysical. As, as, I'm really following Damasio here, actually, in thinking, as it were, that there are physical aspects, as it were, involved in finding something disgusting or nauseating. <laughs> um, so you're right, as well, that's a helpful point. I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on that particular kind of... Now, the question would be, as it were, does the kind of argument I've been using for arguing that the emotion is a kind of unity as it were, carry over to problems for another kind of componential analysis. And I rather think it does, as it were, because the question of these componential cases is, can you have one component without the other? And what do you have in that case? Of course, you're absolutely right to say, there's a noise downstairs, and I think it's a burglar, but then I realise it's my son coming home late from the pub. Okay, <laughs> and it's fine, <laughs> that's terrific. <laughs> the, fear is, the fear is gone. But what's involved in the fear in that case? Is it just the cognition, the thought, it's a burglar? Or is it rather the kind of engaged thought um, in a fearful mode that it's the burglar? <laughs> As well, the kind of experience of that noise may differ. Well, I think that the noise is caused by my son and caused by an intruder. But the kind of experience in that case, in the first case, is a painful or anxiety, anxious form of experience, in the second case, a distinctive kind of experience. So I think we, we, we fall very easily in analytical philosophy into componential analysis. When, and the argument goes like this. It can't be pure cognition. There has to be something else. And that seems correct in many of these cases. But what, then what we do is, what the other thing is, has to be added to the cognition as a further separate component rather than thinking that it changes the nature of the cognition from, you know, from a cold cognition to a hot cognition, as some people say. But that, in a way, is a different argument. Uh, I'm just trying to deal with those aspects of which, as it were, are involved in some place in the emotion, whether that's a singular psychological or, or a complex one, and involve bodily reaction. And thinking, as it were, that one shouldn't compartmentalise Complementalize that. Now, that's a good point. So um, I should be more careful as we're in, in emphasizing the two components here are a purely physical and a, and a psychological component. And the psychological could be either be simple or complex. And now that's your point, isn't it? Yeah, good, thanks. That's right. okay, so I, I have a question. Um, it might have to be the last one, I'm afraid. Um, it was interesting in introduced to teleology quite late on in. Yes, I did. And my question is, is it doing work for you in um, explaining um, or perhaps persuading us um, of the fact that um, a certain kind of psychological capacity can't be reduced or understood in terms of um, non-psychological um, physical, uh, or certain kind of physical capacity, I beg your pardon, can't be under, psychophysical capacity can't be understood in terms of brute physical so in terms of weaving, is it, is it really the capacity to weave properly, one might say, as opposed to merely the capacity to weave understood in some kind of non-normative or non-teleological way that makes that capacity somehow um, the sort of capacity which would, it would be absurd to think of as um, consisting of or reducible to other capacities that aren't aren't characterized in that normative or teleological way. So one can get, if you like, a, a, chemi uh, a capacity of, a, of, a, of a, a chemical substance understood perhaps in terms of capacities of physical, uh, of physical molecules and so forth, to make certain kinds of reductions of capacity. Arguably, I mean, you, may, you may not think so, but, um, but just talking about capacities and processes doesn't automatically rule out Kind of no, it doesn't. It doesn't. So I'm just, the question really is whether the introduction of teleology is the, right is the key. The <coughs> yeah. So I think it's very important. I mean, I think there's a great deal in there, Roland. Um, I think it's important not just to say teleology here. Because, look, quite a lot of the physical processes are going to be biological processes, as somebody pointed out. As well, and there's a definite move from the biological <laughs> to the psychophysical. Um, which I wasn't really focusing on. 
uh, and I'm using this the terminal determinant picture at, at any level, basically. So the biological can arise by the determination of the physical, the psychophysical is a determination of the biological in this way of thinking. Um, so I don't think it's teleology by itself that does the trick. Now you mentioned rationality. Yeah. But I'm not sure that's quite right either, you see, because even in cases of highly irrational anger, when the person desires revenge, you might think there's a kind of teleology present in that case as well, and the same kind of irreducibility claim. So, that's why I was focusing more on skill and know-how, yeah. as it were, as recognisably psychological phenomena, um, which are, of course, goal-directed, but as we're emphasising, as it were, the psychological aspect of them rather than the goal-directedness of them. But I think, in the end, what you're saying should be... Um, in a properly in a, in a properly worked out theory, would play some pretty important part. Um, in a way, that's my question. In a sense, one of these questions at the end of what's distinctive of the kinds of process involved here, which I've been labelling psychophysical, um, which I haven't really addressed. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've been trying to give a framework to think about these questions. As it were, then there's a question of what the correct filling of the what the criterion of the psychological is, uh, which, which I haven't really tried to engage with. I've just been taking cases of those, as it were, and trying to fit those into a, a kind of um, coherent, non-Cartesian story. But you're right. I mean, there's a, there's a, there are many more really important questions about what makes something psychophysical rather than biophysical. Um, so if you were to be to kind of invite me back in 20, 20 years' time, I might have an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we look forward to that very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.